In this video, we're going to talk about macroevolution. We're going to look at some of the things that Darwin discovered as he was traveling around the Galapagos Islands and he was studying different organisms and different fossils. Macroevolution is when microevolution takes place over millions of years and then a new species develops. In the last video, when we looked at microevolution, one of the examples we looked at was guppies and how a guppy population changed when they were in a different geographical location with different environmental factors like having a predator versus not having a predator. When we have a population of organisms that splits into different geographical locations, like for example, the organisms that live on different Galapagos islands or the islands compared to South America, that geographical distance and different environments affects the allele frequencies and it affects the genes that make different organisms fitter. So over huge long periods of time, organisms that are no longer together will evolve differently and then eventually they will not be able to interbreed and they become a different species. Here's a map of the Galapagos Islands just to sort of orient you. So if we look at this Google Earth map and we zoom in, you can see that the Galapagos Islands are off of the coast of Ecuador and there's several islands. And on those islands, different organisms evolved that are very different from the organisms that live on South America or even on each of the different Galapagos Islands. We'll look at a couple of examples. Darwin studied finches. There's about 13 different species of finches on the Galapagos Islands. And if we look at their beak, there are different finches that have different beak shape and sizes. There's different alleles, genes that affect how the beak develops. One of them is a bone maturation protein called BMP4. Another one is called calmodulin and these genes affect how the beak develops. Some of the finches have a long skinny beak and some of them have thicker, shorter beaks. So the beak shape and size phenotype will give them different advantages in different environments. So birds that have a small skinny beak will be better able to eat cactus, whereas a bird with a big beak will either be able to rip off bark from trees to find insects, or will be able to eat bigger, harder seeds compared to the birds with the smaller beak. Over time, these finches developed differences that made them more fit for their specific environment, and over really long periods of time, they became different species. Same with the iguanas. The marine iguanas that live on the Galapagos are different from iguanas that live anywhere else in the world. In this diagram, we are looking at how evolution can occur in two different ways. One way is when we can see an ancestral organism in, say, the fossil record, and we can see the gradual changes that bring about different organisms. This process where we can see kind of intermediate species. This is called gradualism. Whereas over here, sometimes in the fossil record, we see one organism, and then over periods of time, we can see completely different organisms. We call this punctuated equilibrium. So how do we study macroevolution? The three main ways that we can look at how macroevolution has occurred is through fossils, through looking at comparative anatomy, and through looking at comparing molecular sequences. We can compare DNA sequences or protein sequences, and we can compare how similar different organisms are. Fossils are the most direct way to study macroevolution. The fossil record doesn't show every single organism evolving over the entire history of the Earth. We can look at different fossils that were found through different time periods and we can compare those structures. Different things can become fossils. Generally, when we think of fossils, we think of bones, but other things that can become a fossil include feathers and hooves, teeth, scales, shells, anything that can become mineralized can become a fossil. 
But not every single thing is going to become a fossil, right? So the dead squirrel on the road <laughs> is not going to become a fossil. Certain conditions have to occur for fossils to develop. Here are a few other examples of some fossils. So you can see the bone structure and you can also see feathers here. Um, here's a fish skeleton and a shell. So different kinds of things that can mineralize can become fossils. Before we take a look at some primate skulls, I want to just give you a little bit of a reference point and look at the taxonomy of humans. Humans are in the animal kingdom, so we are eukaryotic, we are multicellular, we have locomotion. We are in the phylum chordate, which means we have vertebrae or a backbone. We are mammals. Mammals have mammary glands and feed their young through breast milk. Primates is the order. Okay, so we are a primate. The family is called hominid, and these are including the great apes. And then the genus is homo which means man. All of the organisms that were classified as the genus Homo were bipedal, so they walked upright like us. We are the only ones, we are the only species left from the genus Homo, and our species name is Sapiens. And then if we have a little bit of a look at a timeline, we all kind of have a general idea of when dinosaurs existed, right? So about 250 to 65 million years ago, mammals appeared about 200 million years ago. Primates began to appear around the same time that dinosaurs didn't exist anymore. Hominids appeared about 2 million years ago and then Homo sapiens about 200,000 years ago. And this includes the early Cro-Magnon human. When we think of humans, we think of modern humans, which have been around for about 50 to 70,000 years. And this is when humans began migrating out of Africa into other areas of the world. Neanderthals were the last species in the genus Homo to exist besides us. Different estimates of when Neanderthals became extinct range from 20 to 40,000 years ago. There were possibly hybrid species where Homo sapiens and Neanderthals perhaps interbred. When we look at how primates, Homo sapiens, and hominids evolved, we can see that humans fit into the great ape category. We are the only homo genus left, and we are homo sapiens. We are the most closely related to chimpanzees. We're also very similar to bonobos, and we are in the same family as the great apes. Okay, when we look at some fossils, we can see that there are some similarities and some differences. This diagram is showing the time scale on this axis and about the size of the skull on the bottom axis. So we have different species like Australopithecus was an ancestral organism that likely branched off to other great apes like the chimpanzees and the gorillas and then some of them branched off into the genus Homo. So other Homo species that used to exist like Homo habilis, Homo erectus, um, ergaster, these organisms were bipedal and they were our ancestors. Homo erectus existed for about two million years and then we have Neanderthals, and here is us, Homo sapiens. And you can see that the more closely related organisms have more similar looking skulls that we can see in the fossil record. 
We can also look at anatomical structures. So from the fossils, we can compare anatomy. We can look at the different skull shapes and sizes, and we can compare how closely related different organisms are. And we can see that we are more closely related to the previously existing Homo erectus compared to the current day gorilla. And we can compare other anatomical structures as well. For example, all vertebrate embryos, when, when vertebrates are developing, they have pharyngeal pouches, and these become gills in fish, and they become a larynx in other animals. All vertebrates have a bony tail and fur. Humans are actually born with what's called lanugo, and it kind of looks a little bit like fur and it eventually falls out. So we have some genes that are still similar, but the regulation of those genes might be different. Sometimes we say that we have 99% of the same DNA as chimpanzees. We have 99.9% .9 the same DNA as other humans. We're probably about 60% the same as a fruit fly. So just because we have similarities in gene sequences, we have to also consider the regulation of those genes. So we have alleles that give us hair so we're mammals, but obviously the expression of the amount of hair is different in a human compared to a chimpanzee. We can compare anatomical structures. For example, if we look at the forelimb of a few different species, we can see that the same bone structure kind of exists in all of these mammals. Mammals have a humerus, an ulna, and a radius. We have carpals and metacarpals and phalanges, right? So these are the bones in our arm. They're sort of similar to a horse, but we're probably more similar to a cat. In a horse or other ruminants, their metacarpals and phalanges fuse and form a hoof. And whales have similar bone structure in their forelimb as well, and the same with bats. You can compare how similar different organisms are or how closely related they are by looking at their anatomy. We can also look at molecules. We can compare either DNA or protein sequences. We can look at amino acid sequences in various genes in various organisms. For example, if we compare a gene between human and mouse, we can see that sometimes there is a nucleotide change, but it doesn't necessarily affect the amino acid sequence. And sometimes there is a nucleotide change that does affect the amino acid. So in the human, this isoleucine has been changed to a valine in the mouse. Let's suppose this is a gene for, say, a sodium potassium pump. That is a gene sequence that is found in most living organisms. If we compared this, our human DNA, to a chimpanzee, we would have more similar sequences with the chimpanzee compared to the mouse. So we can use molecular sequences to compare how similar organisms are. And this is an advantage because we can compare organisms that are still alive. So using the molecular record is the most accurate way to compare the similarities and differences between organisms. And some things don't change very much over time. If we look at crocodiles and alligators, they have existed for 200 million years, and they basically look exactly the same as crocodiles from, you know, 200 million years ago. Cassowaries have been around for 100 million years. So organisms don't always have to change. Usually, when the environment changes, different alleles will become more beneficial, but we don't see the same consistent rate of evolution in every single organism. The last thing that I want to talk about. We have been looking at natural selection as the driving force for causing evolution to occur. Natural selection is just one of the mechanisms or one of the factors that affect how organisms can evolve. When we look at natural selection, there's actually three ways that we can break this down. Let's say we have a population 
that is showing recessive alleles, intermediate traits, and dominant alleles, right? Let's pick a trait. Let's suppose this is a bird beak. And down here we have birds that have small beaks, birds that have intermediate sized beaks, and birds that have very large beaks. Now let's suppose the environment is going to select for birds that have very large beaks. Let's suppose it's a dry season and there's only large seeds, and so the birds that have the larger beak are going to be able to survive. So there will be a shift in the population so that it favors the birds that have the larger beak. This is called directional selection. Now in this population, Again, let's just stick with the beak example. Small beaks, intermediate beaks, and large beaks. Now in this population, there is an environmental change that favors the intermediate trait. If you have a medium-sized beak, then the population is going to favor the intermediate phenotype. So this is called stabilizing selection. Now the population is going to change so that there are more organisms showing that intermediate trait. Over here, natural selection maybe will favor either of the extremes. Perhaps the environment will change so that if you have a very small beak or a very large beak, you're going to have an advantage, maybe less competition for food, and then the intermediates are not favored. So then the population will change so that there are more organisms with the smaller beak and more organisms with the larger beak, but fewer organisms with the intermediate trait. And this type of natural selection is called disruptive selection. But natural selection is not the only way that alleles can change in a population. So survival of the fittest is not the only thing that drives evolutionary change. We can have DNA mutations. This is actually the source of all new alleles. Any new alleles that come about are because changes in the DNA sequences affect protein expression, which affect phenotype. An example is human blood type. We have blood type A and B, AB and O. O is actually a mutated version of either type A or type B. Type A and B have antigens on the red blood cells, type O doesn't. That gene sequence has changed. If having type O blood doesn't give you a disadvantage, then that allele will stay in the population. So mutations, most of the time they're detrimental and cause diseases like sickle cell anemia or cystic fibrosis. But if a DNA mutation just changes a phenotype that doesn't cause that organism to be less likely to survive, then that allele is gonna stay in the population. Now we have more genetic variation because we have more alleles. So DNA mutations are really the ultimate source of variation in all populations. Another factor is mating. In animals, mating is non-random. You can see there's a whole bunch of different kinds of sexual selection that occurs. Some fun examples are the blue-footed booby, which is a bird that has blue feet, and he has to do a very sexy dance to attract the female. If that bird doesn't have very blue feet, then the girls are not going to be attracted. Right? Or a peacock. Peacocks have to have big, huge, colorful tails. Even though having a big, huge tail is a disadvantage for evading a predator, the female peacocks prefer the males that have the biggest, brightest tails. And different organisms have different phenotypes that they prefer. Can you think of anything for humans? With humans, things can change with culture and over time, but think about some examples. And then there's migration. If there's a population of organisms and some of those organisms move away and join another population, or if some of a different population comes and joins that population, then alleles are going to be moving from one population to another, and that can affect the survival of different organisms. And the last factor is called genetic drift. Genetic drift is when random events 
can affect a population. So not natural selection. Let's say, for example, there's an earthquake and that kills a large proportion of a population. Alleles from that population may be lost, but not because they weren't beneficial to those organisms. It's just random that an earthquake killed that portion of the population. So we can call this a bottleneck effect, and this can have a significant effect on the evolution of populations, especially if the population is very small. If we have a parent population, and we have two different phenotypes. Let's suppose we have a blue phenotype and a red phenotype. Um, let's say they're birds. We have blue birds and we have red birds. And perhaps being a red bird is beneficial in this example and is maybe a sexual selection phenotype. But then we have some kind of a natural disaster that kills off a bunch of the red birds and now we're left with more bluebirds in this population. These are the surviving individuals, not necessarily because they were the fittest, but because they randomly were the ones that survived. And now this new population is going to have more bluebirds. So many different factors can affect the evolution of populations. <laughs>